You're tuned in to The Keetra Show and listening to SOB, Style of Business. The podcast with your host, Keetra. We aim to highlight the ongoing trek of entrepreneurs and business owners from around the globe, featuring stories that recount their struggles, experiences, and inevitable road to success and self-fulfillment. Welcome to SOB. Hey, what's up, y'all? Thanks for tuning in for another wonderful episode of SOB Style of Business. This is your host, Keetra. And today I have joining me Mr. Patrick Osei, who is the founder and producer of Hot Money Studios based in the UK. And he is a fantastic gentleman, producer, and entrepreneur that's going to be joining us, sitting in to talk about his uh, production studio, some of the projects that he's working on, and just giving us the tips and advice on how we can get moving forward in our endeavors as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and give Patrick the floor with a brief introduction and background, and we will continue to roll from there. So, hey, Patrick, how's it going today? How are you? Thank you for having me, Keetri. I'm good today. Good, good, good. Glad to hear that. And uh, if you will, please just take a minute to share your background and just give us a a brief about industry experience, who you are, and and we'll keep moving. Yeah, so... um... Primarily a producer, so producer, sound engineer, and I run a facility called Hot Money Studios in London. I started this around 2008 um, as a way of just giving back from all my years of experience training in sound engineering and producing to help the new urban community that was building in the UK scene before the UK scene was very small and very niche. So from like 2008, I could see that there was an opportunity for growth. So I set up Hot Money Studios to help that. Wonderful. Yeah. And I, I was curious to know how that scene was because I know you initially started off in a different genre of music, which was the more underground before venturing over into hip hop. So, yeah, definitely go ahead and, and share that as well. Yeah. So, my actual background is, you know, I started off classical. So, I was classically trained from the age of seven years old. At the time, I was being taught by Britain's leading keyboard player, a lady called Margaret Mason, and she was at the top end of the game, and she was sort of teaching me the foundation. So I started off playing, you know, the Mozart and the Beethovens and whatnot. And then when I got to about 10 years old, I got into technology. So I got the computer and the keyboard and the the drum pad and hip-hop. So I started banging on the beats and everything like that. Yeah. And then I slowly evolved more into being interested in the production side of things rather than just straight playing in front of a crowd. And through my high school years, I got more into it. And then eventually I went to a music school in the UK called the Brit School. And it's like, it was a bit like high school musical. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So it was like that. So I've gone in with this kind of like desire to learn music production and I'm in this environment where everyone's sort of singing and dancing every five minutes and you know I did about a year of that and I just said you know what this is not for me I need something a bit more technical yeah I then enrolled onto the school of audio engineering um it's one of the top schools in the world they've got branches in New York and LA they call it SAE and I did 18 month diploma there and then qualified as a sound engineer and then after that I decided to find my foot into the industry so at the time the underground music scene that was popping was uk garage music and it was like an offshoot of house music that came from the detroit house scene yeah. so the uk put their twist on it and had this uk garage movement it was like a different kind of swing so i spent about two years figuring out how to produce the stuff how to make the connections to get into the industry and then eventually i broke through and made, you know, one connection. He sang one of my songs that came out. My name started growing. And it just kind of took off from there. But this is before the UK really had a strong hip-hop rap scene. It was really all about the dance music at the time. So about a year into me doing this UK garage music, the UK underground rap explosion started to form. And I had to make a decision whether to continue making the garage stuff, which is now going out of fashion, and deciding if I was to adapt or die. So I eventually made that, that decision to say, you know what, this is new, it's fresh, it's a bit darker than what I normally like, but it's a new energy. So I adapted and ended up becoming one of the top guys making this new genre called grime music. So grime music became an established genre, which was circulating, and I was one of the top runners there at the time. 
This was back in 2003. Oh, wow. So this was actually before the Hot Money Studio days. This is before. So. Okay, <laughs> got you. So, yeah, we created a monster and grind at the time. We didn't realize what we were doing, but it became like a worldwide phenomenon at the time. But it then went a bit quiet after a few years because it was still like the early stages. So there wasn't a lot of structure. This is pre the internet really being a massive massive counterpart in the establishing of a scene. It was just really relying on the gatekeepers still, you know, radio and magazines. So you had a massive rush at the beginning and then kind of sort of phased out a bit. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, i tell you what, that's an interesting story because, you know, you go from being classically trained to this grime and, you know, more underground. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what... What sort of musical influences did you have growing up, like prior to getting into that production part? Okay, so my musical influences were like 80s pop. So the legend himself, MJ, Luther, you know, the big 80s pop records. Yeah. Billy Ocean. Um, who else is out there? I mean, my dad's collection was so eclectic. He was the one that really got me into music. So he had Bob Marley in the collection. Um, he had Johnny Coltrane, jazz. So I really grew up on a very style of music. When I got into production, I actually went more towards R&B. So I was listening to producers like Ronnie Jerkins and studying his game and obviously the artists that he produced. So Mary J. Blige, Brandy the Destiny's Child stuff. So that's how I learned my production chops by studying Ronnie Jerkins. And then it met, moved on to Timberland, Neptune. So all the big super producers of that era, Swiss Beats, they're the ones that really taught me the chops of production before I even looked at the UK scene. Because at the time, trying to break into the American market as a British producer had never really been done. So it was, a, you know, I was like in my late teens, early 20s, how do I leave this, this is side of the pond to go to America and try and knock on some doors? You know, it was right, like, yeah. yeah. So I said, let me take those skills that I've picked up and all those tricks from Ronnie and Timbo and apply them to the UK scene. And that's what I was able to do. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what, um, from what I've read, I mean, that's what brought about the whole Hot Money Studios, Hot Money Studios concept is because you're obviously producing these tracks for a lot of the independents and emerging artists in, in London, but then eventually you expand those services to include like development and you start working with some major artists as well. So tell us a little bit about Hot Money Studios and how that particular business model came to be. Yeah, so it started after I did the whole UK garage crime thing. I had my little five minutes of fame, left, left my marketing industry. And as you know, with music it's up and down. It's, they say, don't give up your day job. Or you know about Hollywood actors, they have these in between gigs just to keep the, the lights on. So after the whole garage thing, I had to get my in-between gig for a while, figure out the next plan. And it was in that time when I was doing that gig where I said to myself, you know, I've got this equipment sitting at home. I'm still dabbling in production, but I'm not actively doing it. I'm seeing this new growth in 2007 of these young urban kids making this new sound. So I said, okay, I've got this equipment, I've got the skills, I've got the experience, I've got the reputation. It's time to give back. Let's just create an environment where they can come in and you can actually guide and nurture. Because my my number one desire still was to be a producer, like a Ronnie Jerkers or a Timbo. But I had accumulated all these engineering skills from the diploma and obviously putting out records myself. So I said, let me do this engineering thing as a business and give back and make the quality of what they're creating higher. And that's when I decided to go in and start Hot Money Studios in 2008. I found a professional music complex which housed multiple studios. I took the equipment from the house into this professional complex and then became a public business because before that I was working from the bedroom. So all the UK garage success was all from the bedroom. Oh, wow. And this, this was the first time I've actually find a professional business premises, paying rent, and having to incorporate as a professional business. And that was 2008. Wow, from 2008. What sort of transition was that for you? I know, like, physically, you had to, like, move the equipment or just, just move the your workspace, so to speak, from the bedroom mm -hmm. to the business. What type of uh, transition was that for you? Was it easy or was it something that was more of a process? It was definitely more of a process because I had to start thinking about things like, 
the interior design, the, the setup, because now I'm a public building in the sense yeah. that I'm inviting people over. In your bedroom studio, you might have a pizza box lying around or, <laughs> right. you know, a can of Sprite, but it's just like you open the doors to the public. So I just start looking into how does this environment look? What colour chairs or sofas are we using? Should we put a plant here just to create a bit of peace and serenity? So the transition was quite interesting because it took me as an entrepreneur into areas that I've never really had to look at. Customer service, uh, presentation, tell them how I look. So I might want to wear some sweatpants and a hoodie, but it's like, I'm asking people for money for my studio time. I might want to look a bit more presentable. Yeah. So it, it just took me to a different place of thinking. And the transition was quite interesting because at the time I was still doing the nine to five gig, but on a full run, full off schedule. So I was able to build it in a safe way. I, I, I minimized my risk by having that regular income coming in. And I was able to build it on the four days. I wasn't working that kid. So the transition was quite smooth. It wasn't a drastic thing where we were worrying about cash flow every month because we had a backup situation. Love that. Love that. Thanks so much for sharing that background story and history. So now I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the biggest differences that you've noticed when it comes to, let's say, in the past you were promoting and, and gaining exposure for the stuff that you were doing with the garage and the grind, but now you are more working with mainstream R&B, hip-hop, pop. What are the biggest differences that you notice in promoting those those two genres? The biggest differences I've noticed when I'm working with pop, more like sign artists, is obviously there's a bit more pressure on these guys to deliver these big tracks, these big hits. So there's a lot more thought and detail that goes into the sessions and how we're working and, and what we're creating versus the raw talent who have you know a clear mind because they're free from any of these kind of like limitations and restrictions. So they just come with raw energy. I want to make this. And there is no one to really uh, to be accountable to because it's their raw energy. So they come in, they take these unorthodox beats, they say what they want to say, and then they end up going viral because that's who they are. And then once they get into these higher positions, they have to worry about sales and charts and genres and playlists. So the big difference is the pressure level and the process in the studio. Yeah, that's that's definitely an eye opener there. And what do you what do you think about the current landscape for independent artists? Is there really more opportunity just because of the the things that are available? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. I'm more of an optimist, Kitra. Uh, definitely more opportunity. Uh, you know, I've seen the transition from 2008 to now. And one of my clients came down, an Italian guy, came in for for a couple of sessions, did a bunch of tracks, and then he went off and then he just emailed me his music video. And I was like, yo, this looks crazy. And he goes, yeah, we shot this on a, on a cell phone. I uh -huh. said, what? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? So the technology, the internet, the opportunity has removed every excuse now. Ten years ago, there were valid excuses for why guys weren't really in certain positions, oh, we don't, we can't afford a music video and we can't get to that radio station. Now we have Spotify, we have SoundCloud, we have YouTube. We've got high-tech mobile phone technology that shoots 4K. Now, what excuse do we have now to not get the music out there? It's pure laziness. So the opportunities are fantastic right now. Love that. Love that, Patrick. All right. So let's move on. Um, I know you've worked with several independent uh, artists, and then also you've worked with a lot of uh, major artists as well. Do you have a favorite project that you've worked on? I look at each project like a baby, like a child. So they've got their own nuances. So I wouldn't say I have a favorite project because yeah. they all came with different energy, you see? Yeah, they you know... <laughs> you uh, can't some, pick one. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. they're different vibes. You know, when I'm in my pop zone, I have, you know, a liking towards that project, the way they work there, and I'm in my hip-hop zone, my bashment zone. So I just have a more diplomatic view of the whole thing. I like all the clients, all the projects equally. Love that. Love that. All right, so what is your favorite part of the production process? I know you also do the engineering aspect of it, but what, as, as far as production goes, what's your favorite part? So my favorite part is, is really the construction. I love the construction part. Just to look at a blank screen key, like you load up the software and it's like, wow, we have to make something that makes people move and feel. And right. we just do it sound at a time, block by block, figuring out 
how the elements go together. It's a bit like a game of, remember that game Tetris? Oh, yeah. That used to be on the internet. Yeah, it's a bit like that. So the construction part of, of the music production is the most, for me, the fascinating part because, like I said, you go in with a blank page, silence, and you walk away with something that can be an immortal part of society. It's quite incredible. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, I agree. Um, and I guess with the production, I guess that's one hat that you wear. And then when it comes to the actual engineering and the artist development, like share with us a little bit about those services, because I know that you work, you guys are based in London, but I know you work internationally. So you have the production hat, you're also a sound engineer, and you also offer artist development. So just share with us a little bit about those services. Yes, so my day-to-day services are engineering. So most of my clients do come to me for the engineering service. And then now and again, I have a few bigger clients who come to me for the full production. Um, the, the engineering services involve really capturing best vocal and then putting that vocal onto the track that they may bring. 90% of the time, they may bring their own track. They've got their own beat makers. They find beats online. So my day-to-day is actually calling vocals and making a vocal shine on whatever track they supply. Now and again, I get a gig where they say, we want you to create a track from scratch. So what was happening, Kichi, was I had all these talented guys come in, they come with their track, make the vocal sound amazing. Then I stay in touch. I say, let me know when you release it. They release the track, amazing songs, 10 views on YouTube, 100 streams, like no traction, no momentum. And it was kind of concerning because I'm like, these guys are investing in studio time. They're creating these songs and they're not get, they're not really getting anywhere. And I realized what they lacked is, a, is an asset that I actually had. And I had it from the development of my business as an entrepreneur because if I didn't market my studio, Kishu, I would not be in business. Yeah, true. And that was something I realized that a lot of creatives struggled with because it wasn't a natural part of their skill set. And I myself wasn't a natural entrepreneur. I was naturally a creative first transition into entrepreneurship so i did read a lot of marketing books and started a lot of branding books from guys like richard branson seth golden to get an idea of how to think as a marketer so i thought to myself why don't i use that information and help these guys give them that push and that's when the development program started where i started pushing their youtube and their spotify and you know linking them up with video directors and hooking up with bloggers and stuff like that and i I realized that it's about the full conveyor belt rather than being just one part of the supply chain and just waving them by see laser hopefully it goes well you take more control of that and actually give them that information and that push to get to the next level right yeah i love that i yeah that can make all the difference because you can you know like you said you can have all the talent but unless you're actually putting it out there so that people can see it and where it can gain visibility. It might be a little bit pointless if you don't. You have to have that promotion. So um, you just mentioned marketing. You just talked about uh, the importance of that. When it comes to promotion of a record, you have artists that, you know, they, they finish recording. What should be the first step? You have the finished product. What would be a first step? So for me, the first step would be Usually, I try and get in before the actual music is is created because a lot of the times, they're making products without actually identifying an audience. So sometimes it's a little bit harder to figure out a first step when the product's not even right. So I try and make the first step the right product because once you've got the right product, everything can you know fall into place. So the first step, I actually take is to talk to them about their music before we record and find out what are your goals, what are you trying to achieve? And in that conversation, you can actually reveal some weaknesses in what they're doing. So they might say, we want to make songs that sound like the 90s, you know, but we are in 2019. So where's your audience? Because I don't care. That's what I want to make. So already we have an issue. So then they have to think about, okay, what are we trying to do here? Is this a hobby? If it's a hobby, that's fine. You can make songs from the 70s. It's a hobby, you've got realistic expectation. Mm -hmm. So the first step is really figuring out what you're trying to say as an artist. And once you know that, then you can make that music and then we can then help you find that audience. Mm -hmm. And so the, yeah, exactly, teacher. So the step after that will be, where would your audience be? And then using the social media platforms to target that audience. Interesting. Love that. Yeah. And I, I was I was going to add to that as well. Like, you know, there's a lot of ways that 
you can gain exposure without spending a lot of money. So as an independent artist, do you have, or when you work with independent artists, do you have maybe one or two resources that you could share with us in order to gain promotion or to get the word out there about a project? Like, are there a couple of tips you could offer? Yeah, so I'm, I'm into like, I'm into paid promotion. So I feel like Facebook and Instagram provide great opportunity for independent artists because they don't have any cap on their budgets that, that you know, you could apply promo on. So I definitely do agree with, you know, the philosophy that you have to, you have to pay to, to get seen because these guys have put a platform for free. You know, they've never charged us to use Instagram. They've never charged us to use Facebook. And all they ask is for fee just to get seen by the audience. And when I have inter- independent artists complain about that, I ask, this is a business. Do you realize that you're an entrepreneur as an artist? Right. And, you know, you have to start viewing it like that, you know? Right. It's true. Yeah, they come in with a kind of cheapskate attitude. It's like, well, why should I pay Facebook or Instagram to, to promote my music? Well, this is a business. It's like putting up a billboard. Hi, my music is out. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's the resource that I use. I use Facebook promotion. I use Instagram promotion. And um, also just reaching out to people on an individual level. DMs, you can DM people and then ask them about who they are and just be a giver first. I'm a fan of Gary V and his jab, jab, jab theory. You know, just talk to people. Like music is about experiences and shared experiences. So rather than just go in and promote and just be a pusher of content, let's find out what people are going through and have conversations. Just be human. That is an excellent, excellent resource and should probably, like you said, be the first step is, is to give. So we definitely thank you for sharing that. And before we wrap up, Patrick, okay, so this is one that you you probably already know what I'm talking about. This is the, before we um, close out, okay, now you have those independent artists that they create all the music in the world. How important is performing? How important is it that they perform if they're looking to grow their fan bases? And also, too, with that, what's the good first step to be able to be in a position to perform? Performance is, is the last thing that you can't, you know, right now we've been able to game a lot of the, the corporations have been able to game a lot of the music, you know, supply chain. So they've gone from vinyls, to CDs to digital, and they've always found ways of making money. But the gaming of performance, where you can just get rid of the artists, they haven't been able to do that because this whole music game is about connection. And the reason why performing is so important is because you can't fake that connection. Guys can watch concerts on YouTube, they can watch it on TV, but that connection, when you feel that presence in the room, that energy, is everything. And this is what I explain to my independent artists. We're in the connection business, so don't rely on the digital formats as everything. You know, your 10 million streams, people want to see you in person, they want to connect with you. So they have to practice their performance game, find ways of getting out there and performing to the crowd because people's opinions about you can change when they see you live. They could be at the bar and hear your voice and say, yo, what, what was that? And this is after maybe them hearing you 10 times on Spotify, you know? So the performance is everything because it's the true authentic human connection that you can never get away with or, or hide. Great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Patrick Osei, thank you so much for joining us. Before we close out, rather, uh, please let us know where we can find more about you and also Hot Money Studios services online. Um, you can drop your website, social media, Facebook, all that other good stuff. Okay, yes. Yeah. So Hot Money Studios website is www.hotmoneystudios.com. You can find me on Instagram, Hot Money Studios, Facebook, Hot Money Studios, and Twitter, Hot Money Studios. All right, Patrick. Thanks so much for joining us. We truly appreciate your time. Thanks, Ketria. All right, take care. You see, bye-bye. Thanks for hanging out with us here on SOB. We hope this episode has been resourceful. If you'd like to check out the latest articles or follow Keetra's website updates, just log on to Keetra.com or follow her on Twitter at K-E-E-T-R-I-A.